Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Career webinar series. My name is Rachel Burkhan Rommelfanger and I work with the Alumni Career Program team here in the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar today that is featuring Alderman Amea Pawar. He is a dual graduate of the University of Chicago with both a master's in science and a master's of art from the School of Social Service Administration. And I want to share with you a fun fact was that Amea has been a life, a long time Cubs fan and he wanted to be a baseball player when he grew up. So that's a quite different job than being alderman in the city of Chicago. Um, so I'm going to hand the controls over to Amea. Okay. Well, thank you for having me, everyone. Uh, so I've been an alderman here in the city of Chicago for the last seven years. So I'm in the final year um, a, of my second term and it's my final term. Uh, but I got into politics primarily um, because of the work that I did here at the University of Chicago. Um, so I got into, um, you know, thinking about how I could make a difference after Hurricane Katrina. And I was watching what was happening on TV and I saw the response and I saw policymakers and politicians blame poor people for poverty in the aftermath of one of the greatest or the biggest natural disasters in US history. And so I started thinking about, okay, so how do we prevent another Hurricane Katrina from ever, you know, the kind of response and recovery we saw from have ever taking place again. And so I applied to school here and I started uh, the threat and response management program here with, and then eventually on to SSA and started to think about, well, what do we need to do differently um, at the community level, at the state level, and at the federal level to be better prepared and build more resilient communities. It's also here at the University of Chicago where I met Sharna Epstein, who is my wife, but also the chief operating officer at UEI. And she started the program here at Threat Response um, because she worked on the response to Hurricane Katrina here in Chicago. In fact, she led the city of Chicago's response to Katrina um, here in Chicago and in Illinois. And so we started thinking about, okay, so what, what's the issue? And in the course of our research um, and studying disasters over the course of a century, we found that there is this really broken frame in American public policy where um, we look at designing policy based on who deserves and who we believe doesn't. Um, so there's this notion that, you know, somehow if you don't lift yourself up by your bootstraps or if you haven't taken personal responsibility, well then, you know, it's your responsibility at the end of the day and you didn't do enough. And this plays out over and over again after every major disaster over the course of a century. And this is the foundation of American social welfare policy. And so I thought, okay, so how do I take that and break that frame? How do I change the frame about what we think about people who are vulnerable or people who are struggling and try to make sure that we prepare communities better? And that meant learning for local office. And so I ran for alderman. And, uh, you know, here I am seven years later, but I've spent a bulk of my time in office working on issues related to social justice. Because I think, again, it's important to break those frames. You know, uh, people who are suffering, people who are struggling, aren't doing so by choice. There are institutional barriers that prevent people from being successful. And the best way to design public policy is to, is to acknowledge those institutional barriers lift them to the extent you can and figure out how to give people a lift up. And that's what I've been doing in politics. That's great. So folks, I see that you're on, so you can send us your questions and I can ask them to Alderman Pilar. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, so you're talked about wanting to do justice and break this frame. So what do you think of the policies and things you've been able to get passed in the city of Chicago yeah. have been a part of that? So going back to disaster, one of the most, uh, interesting things that we found in the aftermath of Katrina and then also in other disasters is if you ask someone to evacuate at a moment's notice um, and you don't have access to a car or access mm -hmm. to formal credit or a bank account or gas to put in your car or somewhere to go, well then of course um, there are going to be issues during a response and recovery. If there is historical mistrust of government mm -hmm. uh, because of failed responses in the past, then of course people are going to have um, questions about what their government is asking them to do. And so the way you break that is by acknowledging what the barriers are. And so, for example, here in the city of Chicago, uh, a couple of the issues that I worked on is one to raise the minimum wage. 
uh, it, it goes to $13 an hour by 2019. And it's still not enough, but it is a dramatic step forward. But also another issue that's connected to vulnerable communities is the ability to call in sick if you get sick. Mm -hmm. Most people um, until 2016 in Chicago, if you didn't wear a tie to work, or if you didn't um, work in a uh, um, an office setting, lots of people don't have access to paid sick leave. And so that puts people in a position of having to risk losing their job or retaliation simply for calling in sick or taking care of a loved one who isn't feeling well. So I've been working on issues to look at, okay, so what makes people vulnerable um, and what are the barriers? So it's not just paid sick leave. It's looking at raising the minimum wage. Uh, some of the other issues we're going to be working on are fair scheduling, right? So one of the things that I hear over and over again from people are, okay, well, minimum wage jobs are not a career. You should go get training so you can go do something else. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, but can we look at the situation for workers who are making minimum wage? Uh, how do you go to community college at night or, or a university if you're working 12 to 8 one day, 11 to 7 the next, 7 to 3 the next, uh, the next day? How do you find childcare? How do you make ends meet, find childcare, and try to better yourself if there are barriers in place where you don't even have control over your schedule? So when I think about vulnerability, it's not just raising the minimum wage, it's not just paid sick leave, it's not just making sure there are fair scheduling practices, but it's also making sure that we're supporting working families with things like paid family leave. So these are issues that lots of people who wear ties to work take for granted, but are issues that many people who work just as hard as people who work in professional settings um, don't have access to simply because there has been value placed on their work and their worth. And I want to break that. That's wonderful. Do you think that this commitment to seeing the whole worth of people, systemic injustice playing out, does any of that come from your education? Because I know you have two degrees mm -hmm. from the university, from your studying here at the University of Chicago. Yeah, I think uh, so much of where I am today is rooted in one, some of the work that my wife did here um, in Chicago leading the response to Katrina, where you know Chicago is very much a model for what to do after a major disaster. Because when we took in 10,000 evacuees from the Gulf Coast, um, we uh, worked with them on mental health issues, workforce development, housing and affordable housing, uh, asset development. Um, and so we looked at uh, uh, the evacuees as a whole. It wasn't just, here's three days worth of food, water, and shelter, and now you're on your own. It was, okay, we're going to have to deal with the issues that are pre-existing, that existed before the, these evacuees arrived in Chicago, plus the more acute needs after they got here. That is a human service oriented, a human approach to mm -hmm. um, helping people who are suffering. That comes from her experience and her experience at SSA, but also my experience at SSA, where we were told to challenge um, the frames through which public policy is developed. That if there are socially constructed views on how we view other people, that it's time to challenge that, that poor people are weak, that poor people are oftentimes the most resilient people because it costs more to be poor. And to challenge the assumptions that are put out there by policymakers and politicians, and in some cases, break those assumptions so that we actually help people who need the most help. Great. We have, I'm gonna, even over here because we have another question. How do you launch a campaign for local office in Chicago? What resources and networks did you access when planning your run? So um, I think my story is a little unique because I didn't have any money um, and I, I wasn't connected and no one recruited me. I um, simply wanted to make a difference. So the resources that I had were my human resources, my friends and family. Um, I had, you know, Sharna, my wife, with me. We knocked on doors for two years. We didn't have the ability to um, put uh, lots of mail pieces in people's mailboxes mm -hmm. or advertise on billboards. Um, we simply out hustled our opponents by knocking on every single door in my community. 
um, and getting to know the issues and getting to know people and building trust with my community. And um, so my point in saying all this is, I don't think there is a, is a specific formula to running for office, um, but I do think the one thing you should be prepared for if you're thinking about running for office is a willingness to go meet people where they are, hear them out, and then engage in a conversation. And I think that to me is the most effective and powerful way uh, about politics. It's very retail. It has to be face to face. So how many hours did you spend knocking on doors? We said you uh, yeah. hustled them, but what does that actually look like? So I can give you a picture of what my life was like. I was uh, on staff at Northwestern. I was working full time. I was going to school full time here at SSA. Uh, so I would manage that and then come home every night and go knock on doors uh, till about 8.30. We did that uh, five days a week. And then on the weekends, we would knock for four or five hours each day and then go home and do the other things that you have to do, like you know, write a paper or something. Oh. Uh, it was uh, tiring, uh, stressful, but incredibly fulfilling and um, rewarding. What made it the most fulfilling? Knowing that when you meet people at their doors and you're talking to them and looking at them, looking at them in the eye and having a conversation about the issues or about a vision, um, and when they, whether they push back or whether they agree with you, that human connection, that is politics. And our politics is a reflection of the conversations we're having with one another. And if the conversations we're having with one another are broken or biased or prejudiced or stereotyped in one way, then the people we elect are gonna be a reflection of that. But if we pay attention to and support candidates who are willing to talk about social justice and engage with people at a very retail level and not just judge people based on how much money they bring to the table, our politics will be a better reflection of where people actually are. And to me, and it was uh, rewarding and helped me uh, have more faith in the system when people were ready to engage, even though in the beginning, most people thought I didn't have a chance. Mm. And then when you, the second time you ran, you had 82% of the vote, which was the highest mm -hmm. margin with anyone won. So what changed? Did anything change between those two runs? Um, I think, you know, the, the thing about voting, um, the thing about running for office is that it, it, is, a, it is a visceral experience. And what I mean by that is um, you have to be able to build trust with people. Um, and one thing that I often say to people is, you may not agree with every decision I make. In fact, you may disagree with lots of decisions I make. But if you start to see that the decisions I make come from a bad place, or if you think the decisions I make are uh, rooted in some dishonest motive, um, or if I've lost your trust, it doesn't matter if the community improves or there are good things happening because I'm toast. So the one thing I do spend a lot of my time focusing on is making sure we're transparent and honest about how we got from point A to point B and recognizing that people may not agree with me, but I'm trying to make the best decision I can. And we were very straightforward after I got into office to say, we're gonna have to raise taxes at some point. Um, there are some dif difficult decisions ahead, but if we get through them, the city will be in a better place in the long term. Um, I focused a lot of my energies on public schools and neighborhood institutions and strengthening public institutions. Um, and I think I earned people's trust. Um, and, and I worked, uh, and I was very intentional about making sure that we were working to earn their trust, even if they didn't like the end decision I made. So you talked a little bit about working with the people in your community, mm -hmm. but so I know you, you talked about getting this minimum wage thing passed and paid sick leave. So how do you get these initiatives passed in the city council of Chicago? So that's a little bit different than having an intentional conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm really annoying. Um, so when I'm working on a piece of legislation, I will sit outside of, an, of a colleague's office uh, and I'll wait for them to show up or come out so that I can talk to them about the piece of legislation I'm working on. I will call them. I will text them. I will... Um, come to them in city council and build consensus. I mean, truly, um, I'm joking with part of it, but I'm also very serious that uh, passing legislation requires building a coalition. And passing legislation oftentimes meaning means pulling people along or leading people who 
aren't exactly where you are on an issue. It's building their trust so they can say, okay, I don't know that I agree with the Maya 100%, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna place a bet on this and hope that it works out. Or I can see what he's, what he's working on here, and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna put some faith into it. I'm not there yet. Um, it's about cobbling together coalitions of people who don't necessarily see things um, from the same perspective to move things. And in many ways, I use this example a lot. This is what most of you guys do at work. Politics is no different um, than the kinds of relational issues people have to navigate in their own workplaces. You have to work with people you like. You have to work with people you don't like. You have bosses who steal your ideas. Um, but you, no matter what happens, you have to go home and then process that, go to bed and wake up and go back to work the next day. Um, and politics is no different except my life plays out on the papers. Mm. And your decisions. Yeah. 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 Has that put any pressure on your family that all the attention of being a politician? Um, yeah. Um, you know, this is a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, it is a choice that I made that impacts everybody around me. Um, and it requires everyone to be very supportive of my career and ambitions mm -hmm. and goals in, as a public servant. So it's not as if something I can do on my own. Um, you need good partners. Um, and I'm lucky, you know, I've got a great partner in Sharna because I think in many ways she has uh, sacrificed a lot to make sure that mm -hmm. I'm successful. Um, and you need that. Mm -hmm. And so from a family perspective, you're away a lot. Um, mm -hmm. you, there are lots of nights where, you know, you're at community meetings or you're on the road. Um, but all of it is to help people. That's the end goal. But it does take a toll. Um, mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the reason why I committed to eight years, you know, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't run over and over and over again is that, I made a decision early on to say, you know, there's a block of my life that I can dedicate to, you know, sometimes putting other things aside so I can try to work on the issues I really care about. Um, and so, you know, it does take its toll, but uh, it's worth the sacrifice, but you can't do it without good partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, definitely your wife was knocking on those doors five hours a day on Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. so just that time. How did you, how do you manage like having your life outside? It sounds like it's a lot of work to be an alderman in Chicago. Yeah, it's a lifestyle. I mean, you're always on. Um, it's a great job. Um, how do you, I mean, it was the question, how do you balance it? Yeah. Uh, you really don't. Um, it's, you can't. Uh, you do your absolute best uh, to be present in what it is that you're doing, but it's really hard not to have what's happening in city council or um, if there is a major event to not always have it on the back of your mind or at the front of your mind, depending on what's happening. Um, it is a, uh, you know, I'm responsible for 60,000 people that I represent in my community. And then broadly 2.8 million people who live in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it is, it is something that is fulfilling, but also stressful. So walk us through, what's a day like? So sometimes you have council meetings, but I'm sure sometimes you have to be in your ward. So what is, what is your average day or week like as an alderman? Uh, it varies from day to day. Um, and it varies what else is happening. Um, but, you know, on most days, you know, I do the pick up and drop off of our daughter to childcare. So I get up, get my uh, daughter ready. My dad helps us. Uh, so I, when I talk about family support, you know, we have uh, grandparents that are, for, for one daughter that we have, we have four people constantly supporting us to make sure our life works. Mm -hmm. uh, so we get my daughter off the childcare and then I go to the ward office. We have, you know, meetings with constituents or community groups. And then usually there's a community meeting um, at, in the evenings. And then of course there's the political events that you have to go to, right? To make sure you are mm -hmm. hobnobbing, so to speak. But that's where some of the business gets done, where you're building coalitions and building trust. And then, of course, there are block parties and other weekend activities. And so it is a seven day a week job. And, um, you know, there are some weeks that are slower than others, mm -hmm. uh, but it is constant and but great. So if folks so you kind of 
told them they need to be a hustler if they want to be mm -hmm. elected to be an alderman. What other things should they be considering or know about if they wanted to be a public servant in Chicago? I think if you care about your community um, and you want to serve the public, that's all that you really need to do. Uh, that's the only qualifications in my mind to run for public office. I, uh, I reject the idea that you need to have a certain pedigree or a certain amount of money, um, and I can keep going down that list. I think if you love your community and you care about it and you want to do good, um, you should run for office. And I think um, good, we need more good people to run for office. Um, there's a shortage of that. And, and I get it, what people see on TV, um, there's been sort of this push to celebritize politics, so to speak. Um, I think average people, people who just care about their community should run, um, particularly women and, and even more so women and women of color and people of color need to run for office. And there is no such thing as a right time in your life. It's hard, it's a sacrifice, but if you're up for it, do it. So if someone wanted to start getting involved, maybe their goal is to eventually mm -hmm. run for public office, but they're like, I haven't really been involved in this in any way. What, what should their next steps be? I, 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 again, I think there are some people who would say that you should volunteer for a campaign and then work for a campaign and then work your way up and then eventually run. Um, and I think in some ways for some people, those stepping stones make sense. So you get some mm -hmm. experience. Um, but I think there are other people who are just ready right now and they don't need to go through those stepping stones. I didn't, um, you know, I had the same people telling me, uh, you know, Maya, you should really wait your turn. You have good ideas, but you should really wait your turn. Um, and the thing that I found in my experience is when you listen to other people in that way, uh, you are placing your life in other people's hands. And I've always felt that, and I, I give this advice to everybody is, um, the second you put your life in someone else's hands and you make decisions based on other people, um, you're going to be waiting forever. Your turn may never come. You need to, you have your own agency and you should, you should control that and, and do what you think is right and run when you think you're ready. Yeah. Um, was there, did you have more money when you ran the second time? Oh yeah. I mean, so I can tell you that, um, when I was running the first time I was running against an incumbent who had a million dollars. I had zero. Uh, I raised, uh, and I'm proud of it. We raised, you know, ten, fifteen thousand uh, dollars when we we're four weeks before the election in January, uh, in January of 2011. I mean, that, while that sounds insignificant compared to a million, uh, that's the network I had access to, and I think people gave me what they could, and mm -hmm. it was their hard-earned money. So I, was, I honor that, um, and we won. In spite of the fact that you know the the incumbent dropped out, put someone else in, the mayor supported that person. They had hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I think it's a testament to it's not just the money. It is mm -hmm. money certainly plays a role, but I think the message and the connection with people is the most important. Now the second time around, it was obviously a lot easier to raise money. Um, I think we had done good work as an incumbent. It's easier to raise money, and so we did. Um, and so you know, I, I don't knock money. I just think that. Uh, you shouldn't be judged solely on the basis of your access to certain networks or access to a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that's good advice for those folks that you're saying, just just run if mm -hmm. you're ready. And yeah. maybe you don't need the money, just get your name out there and, yeah. and give it a shot. Yeah. But there's the opportunities for you. I mean, remember, sometimes running for office is about raising issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's about elevating the debate. Um, and And I think there are a lot of people out there who have a lot of contributions to make that may feel like they're not ready, but I think are absolutely ready. And I think that's why I'm pushing people. It's time. Mm -hmm. You need to get involved. And we are seeing more women, more people of color running yeah, yeah. in this election cycle. So I yeah. think that's really exciting. But to keep pushing that message, I'm sure is very important. We need to get more young people involved and young people running for office. Again, it comes back down to, um, no one is going to say, okay, now it's your turn. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to see transformative change in government or in public policy, we just need people who are willing to be bold and take chances and get involved. And then people in the institutions to support them. Mm. Um, and that, that, that's a trickier and a longer conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. 
Well, so, but it sounds like you're getting near the end of your eight years. Yeah. So, and I know that not all, everybody watching this might know this, that you did put, throw your hat into the ring for the Democratic primary for governor here mm -hmm. in the state of Illinois. Do you know what's next? You don't have to. Uh, I don't know what's next. Um, running for governor was an incredible experience. Um, and uh, it was, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just getting tired thinking about it. Um, but, you know, I spent a big part of 2017 um, on the road, traveling around the state. We went to 90 of the 103 counties in the state. Um, spent a majority of our time in, you know, I'm a proud Democrat, um, but I've spent a majority of my time in Republican um, counties um, because uh, I think it's important to have a conversation. Like I said, I knocked on every door when I ran for Alderman. I didn't look at a list and say, well, those are Democrats. I'm only knocking on those doors. I knocked on everyone's door. Um, and I felt like while you can't knock on everyone's door in Illinois, it's important to show up and it's important to start a conversation um, with people who voted for other candidates or other parties uh, because we are divided as a state and a nation and you don't heal those divides unless you actually go out and talk to people and hear them. Yeah. So how is running for governor different than running for alderman? Or was it? Um, I don't think it was that different. I mean, I think it's a bigger scale, right? It's a big mm -hmm. state. Um, it's a big state. Uh, but the approach was very much the same which was to go and meet people where they are. Um, I knew, for example, that uh, there was a, a narrative about me, right? The Chicago alderman running for governor, right? There's a lot of baggage that comes with that. But when you show up and you talk to people and you look at them in the eye and you talk about the issues, um, about their communities and what's important to them, uh, those stereotypes or those ideas that they might have about me or I might have about them break down because I'm a human being just like they are. We care about good jobs and schools and investment in community. Um, it's hard to um, build these narratives up about other people um, when you show up and talk to them. Mm -hmm. So look, look, there's a big divide in the state, Chicago versus downstate, downstate versus Chicago. Those people in Chicago, those uh, broken schools in Chicago public uh, public schools, there is this narrative that's been used to pit Chicago against the rest of the state. Um, and it's been politically expedient for politicians. But that has had a corrosive effect on, on our politics. Um, and I believe that the best way to help people is, direct, is to have a conversation about the fact that we rise and fall together. We're connected. Mm -hmm. It's not either or. And unity is what drives change. That we can disagree on issues, there could be a scrum about public policy, but if we're not unified in this underlying belief or fundamental belief that we're Illinoisans, well then nothing changes. And so that's why I got into the race, why I spent a majority of my time in red counties, in counties that went heavily for Donald Trump, is I felt it was important to connect and try to help people reconnect with one another. So I guess what that makes me think about is Governor Rahner and our budget impasse mm -hmm. during the last four years. And how, so your message of justice and wanting to connect people, how have you seen that play out in your own work and also as you're talking with people on the campaign trail? So I don't, you know, I don't want to be overly partisan, but one of the things that I've watched Governor Rahner do over the last three plus years, um, and sort of this has been a tactic of other uh, very conservative governors, is you know to, to create a major divide between urban areas and rural areas. Right, to go to rural areas and say it's those people over there, and truly, what it is is it's to say go to poor white communities and tell poor white people that they're struggling because of those people in Chicago or those people in that big city, and you know that's code for black and brown people. Mm -hmm. But the underlying issues, I'll give me an example. I've been to many former factory towns in Illinois, many towns that are uh, you know currently on a major river that were shipping hubs. Uh, places where pre-NAFTA communities were doing very well. We signed a trade deal, the factory or the major employer left, and people were promised investments. And the only investment that came was from Super Walmart. So you fast forward 25 years and you go talk to people like we did. 
And you'd, you'd hear from people and say, you know, I don't believe any politician. Because one thing I was told was when I was making 25 bucks an hour 20 years ago, and now I'm making 10 because I'm at Walmart, I was promised investment in jobs 25 years ago. So you can see how a demagogue gets into office if you let a community wither on a vine for a generation, mm -hmm. um, you can see what the end result is. And this is an issue that's repeated itself across the rest of So pitting people against one another makes no sense to me because the economic changes in rural America are the same things, are the same issues that have impacted the south and west sides of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, when the steel mills or the meatpacking plants left. So the underlying issues here are when people don't feel safe, when people don't feel like they can put food on the table or provide for their family or have a shot at the American dream, and then they're ignored for a generation or two, that's how we get to the politics we are today. And the way you get back to a better set of politics is to go hear people, not pit them against one another. Let's see, we have some more questions. Oh, yeah, quite a few. Um, what does the future of progressive public policy look like in Chicago? How confident are you that we can create and implement change with for a graduated income tax and higher minimum wage? I think uh, the good part about, um, well, maybe it's not good, but I think what, State and federal governments have not been doing their job in addressing what's happened to communities over the last 40 years, right? So we went from a, a manufacturing industrial economy 40 years ago to a very service sector uh, based economy today. So people who made strong wages with benefits and family protections 40 years ago have been now been pushed into generation by generation to jobs that are low wage, low benefits, and little opportunity for advancement. And the federal government is responsible for correcting some of these market forces, right? So that everyone has a, has a fair shot. They haven't been. In fact, what they've been doing is saying, well, what we should do is, uh, one, force people to lift themselves up by their quote bootstraps, right? Make personal responsibility paramount. And then two, build public policies around trickle-down economics, which is, I know I'm at the University of Chicago, but it's never worked. Um, sorry. Uh, I think the thing is, uh, what we should be focusing on is understanding that if the federal government's not doing their job, state governments are not doing their job, then innovation is only happening at the municipal level. And that's why cities like Chicago have led on the minimum wage increase. That's why we led on paid sick leave. And that's why also we're pushing on a graduated income tax at the state level. A lot of this is being driven by municipalities, big and small, and pushing their legislators to say, stop paying for public schools with property tax dollars. That is an unequal, unjust system. The state has a responsibility to pay for public schools. That is driving the conversation on the progressive income tax. And um, my hope is that uh, we have a positive result in November. And I think, um, you know, I'm not trying to be overly partisan, so, but uh, that we end up with a graduated income tax here in the state. Someone said, can you tell us about yourself and three musicians? <laughs> so I guess three, you know, artists that you like to listen to Okay, uh, Johnny Cash, uh, CCR, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revisited, and Tupac Shakur. Why do you pick those three? I think on both ends, I think Johnny Cash, if you listen to some of his music, he's like the original uh, on criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you listen to Man in Black, I mean, that is all about criminal justice reform. Um, and that was 50 plus years ago. He was talking about um, an unjust society and when we uh, uh, criminalize poverty and we throw people away and uh, lock them up for, for, uh, for not paying their fees or fines or criminalizing poverty, well, you end up with really bad results. And then Tupac on the other end of the spectrum and, you know, in many ways was saying some of the same things, which is, you know, if you criminalize 
uh, simply being black, um, you're never going to, I mean, you, you're building up a government and a society based on institutional racism. And he talked, I mean, spent a lot of time talking, uh, I should say, laughing about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. What a, what a fun question. Another one is, so how have you seen your leadership skills develop being serving a political office? Um, I, I, I think I've learned um, to be a better listener um, and to be more empathetic. Um, I think the thing about being a leader is to be able to hear what people are saying, whether they work for you or whether you represent them, whether part of your constituency, is to be able to hear them and understand that when they're bringing a concern to you or they're upset with you, it's not personal, that they are um, upset or concerned about the issue that they're bringing to you. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is a direct reflection of training at SSA, mm. right? Um, being a social worker r requires good listening skills, being empathetic. Uh, trying to separate what your bias may be from that conversation um, and just focusing on the person and what they're saying. So I think um, empathy, I think, is, um, I think, a skill that um, I've developed partly because of this job and probably because I've had a good team around me and support system to help push me become a better leader and, and call me out when I'm uh, going down the wrong road. So it sounds like there's accountability is in there as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think they they are not shy about telling me when I am wrong. Um, they are not shy about um, calling attention to a decision that we should reverse. Um, and I think in 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 having that support system around me, um, it's helped us avoid make big mistakes. We've made mistakes. Um, but it's helped us avoid making mistakes where people lose faith in the institution or the office. Um, because, you know, politics, um, especially in a vacuum, you know, sometimes you just get a fun house, you mirror of the world. Um, and, and I don't think people see it, see things that way. So I think sometimes you just need to have that perspective from someone saying, hey, you're wrong on this one. And here's why. And then you have to be willing to listen. And so when you say like, you know, your team, do you think that's just the staff that surrounds you or who is on, when you think of your team, who's yeah. on your team? So I've been, I've been fortunate. So my former chief of staff, Jim Poole, uh, who's now, he just left a couple weeks ago to work at NAMI Chicago. Um, I met him at SSA. So we were classmates. We not, he also knocked on doors with us. So I had, uh, he worked with me. I had my wife who is a constant sound sounding board. Um, and she is, uh, you know, a fierce social justice advocate. So I think she's always willing to challenge um, challenge me on my assumptions and on my uh, positions. And I think it's helped me become a better leader. I think, um, and then my training in emergency management also here in, at the University of Chicago, uh, I think has been helpful because the thing about emergency management uh, is that you have to convene people. Uh, you're not the expert on eight or nine different issues. What you are as an emergency manager is a convener of people who know their issues. You bring them together and then you make a decision based on all the information that they've brought to bear. That I think that skill set with SSA and emergency management, I think has has been very useful and also been a very big support. How did you discover the emergency management program? I know you got you were interested in that mm -hmm. with Katrina. But not everybody who is watching this, I think, is as familiar with our grand school program. So how did you find that? I was looking, you know, um, I was uh, in the midst of a, a master's program at the uh, at IIT in public administration. I was finishing that up. And I was thinking about, okay, how do I get more formal training in emergency management? And the thing that's happening, what happens in most fields is that um, fields sort of come together and then they formalize over time. And what happened with emergency management, especially after 9-11, was uh, you had firefighters and police officers and homeland security professionals talking about, okay, so there's these complex events, right? Terrorism, natural disasters. How do we build a profession around this so that it's not just uh, very response-oriented, meaning police and fire and life safety? 
that there is a human component that involves that's involved in recovery. And I think people started thinking about, okay, so how do we formalize this and build a profession and build and grow the profession? Um, and there weren't many institutions across the country that were investing in the formalization of uh, emergency management. Um, the University of Chicago was on the leading edge. And I know they've been working with Argonne on this. Um, and so I saw the program just doing Google searches and I was like, this is it. This is where I wanna be. I hope I can get in. All right, well, so Graham has this emergency management degree. Um, another question that I that has come through for us is, so did someone ask you to run? Like you talked about what motivated you internally, but so how did you make that leap? Uh, no one asked me to run, but I had people around me that we were, when we were talking about social justice um, and some of the issues related to income inequality. Um, as we were talking about it, you know, I had a lot of people, you know, say, well, why don't you think about running for local office? Um, so it really just was a confluence of events. It was, um, you know, watching what happened after Katrina um, here in Chicago, watching sort of the aftermath of selling off parking meters without having a con honest conversation about how we structure city services and how we pay for them. And thinking, well, you know, how do I get involved and in, in force a better conversation? And truly, it was really just having good people around me and then making the leap so that people, um, really, it was just about making the leap. I don't, I, when I'm thinking about it, it's just, if I didn't have the support network, I don't think I would have been confident about jumping in. Um, but I think having that support network enabled it. Did you have a mentor or do you have one now? that worked with you when you were running or has worked with you while you've been in office? I, um, Senator Durbin has been um, really good to me. I think he has uh, spent time, you know, kind of talking with me about, you know, how he sees leadership and how he's been able to manage, um, you know, being a senator, the senior senator from Illinois, um, representing Democrats and Republicans. And while we are a blue state, most of the state is red. In fact, an overwhelming majority of the state is red. And yet he continually figures out how to represent people across the political spectrum without becoming a divisive figure. So he has been um, a mentor in many ways. Um, I really appreciate um, his leadership. Uh, Governor Quinn was also very good to me. And I think, again, it was uh, interesting kind of being able to be uh, working with him on some issues and watching how he makes decisions. Um, and then also like, I just, I think there are a lot of people um, who I've worked with at City Hall um, that I've you know become good friends with. Like, uh, David Spielfogel, for example, um, I wouldn't call him a mentor, he's a friend, mm -hmm. a good, a dear friend, but I've watched how he's been able to navigate complex politics as someone who worked for the mayor, as someone who had to work with aldermen um, and figure out how to make things work. So um, I'm very lucky, I've had good people around me and uh, I've met really good people. Um, but I think, you know, I've tried to take a little bit from everybody and try mm -hmm. to think about, okay, so what does this mean for me and how I um, carry out my work? For those thinking about running for office, what should they look for in a mentor? I think someone is willing to give you um, sort of an unvarnished opinion um, on, on your ideas, mm -hmm. but then also at the same time give you an unvarnished opinion without dissuading you from acting on them. Mm -hmm. Someone who can actually hear those ideas, provide constructive criticism, and then at the same time, even if they don't agree, help you um, carry out those ideas. I think that to me is the biggest thing, is, is, is someone who is willing to support you regardless of whether they agree with you or not. Mm -hmm. um, so your election to Alderman was an amazing upset to the old guard of the Democratic machine in the 47th Ward. What was the key to success? And are you helping any like-minded UC grads who are interested in running? Uh, if any UC grads want to come and talk to me about running for office, I'm I'm available. Please do reach out and I will sit down and we will kind of go through it and I can give you sort of a, um, 
how, um, you know, my experience, like I'm doing here today. Um, I, uh, I think in terms of beating the machine and I try to look at this as not, not, not trying to label people in that way. Mm -hmm. I, because I think what was helpful to me in winning re-election was a lot of people who didn't vote for, vote, uh, who didn't vote for me the first time did the second time. So I, I avoided a runoff in the first term with 50.8% of the vote, right? In the second uh, race, it was 82%. That means people crossed over. Um, and we were, again, I was getting really good advice and I had good people around me. They were intentional um, uh, with uh, this idea that the election is over. You represent everybody. They don't have to like you. You treat everyone the same. No one gets special treatment because everyone gets special treatment. And that was our motto in the office. And I think we won a lot of people over. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who might consider themselves part of the old guard or, you know, um, I think we were we, we did our absolute best to try to be fair with everybody, even with the supporters, who in some cases felt like they should have gotten special treatment because they were early uh, uh, advocates of mine. Um, but I think when you treat everyone the same, you also, I think in many ways, maintain integrity in the system. Because then no one can say, well, I know a man. I know he'll do X, Y, and Z because I know him. Well, you might have my phone number, but that doesn't mean you're going to get treated differently. And if I have to say no to you, I'm going to say no to you. Um, and if I can help you, I will, just like I will for someone who helped me or even worked against me. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like to treat your constituents, give them special treatment, which you give to everybody? So my job in many ways as an alderman is like being a social worker. Um, you're kind of running an inbound call center, right? People, think about it. When people come to an alderman's office um, or uh, they call, you know, they're usually here on an issue. Mm -hmm. It's usually because they've tried working around the issue. Or they've reached out to 311. Now they need their, their local elected official to advocate on their mm -hmm. behalf or sometimes run interference or find out what's not working. So in many instances, by the time people get to you, they're here. Now, mm. our job is to not take it personally. Mm. Our job is to try to do our absolute best to hear them and then figure out a way to find a solution for them. Um, that's what it's like running an office and representing 60,000 people is that you have to treat every call, even if, say, for example, there's one big issue and you get 40 calls on that issue, I get it. By the 35th call, you're probably not feeling so good after getting yelled at about the same issue. But we do our absolute best to treat every single one of those calls equally because those people aren't talking to the other 38 callers. Mm -hmm. So we want to treat everyone with respect and empathy, and we want to hear them out. Can you talk about how being the first Asian American and Indian American elected to office in Chicago and Illinois has influenced your work and also as being a first generation American? Um, it was a great honor to be the first uh, Asian American, Indian American elected to city council. I, um, but you know, I don't represent um, an Asian or South Asian or Indian American community. Um, and it, I think it was, I hope, an eye-opening experience for the Indian American community too. Mm -hmm. um, because when I first started uh, talking about running, I would go to various constituencies, including leaders in the South Asian community and say, look, I'm running for all of them. I'd love it if you'd support me. And the response was, mm, that's the 47th word. Uh, no one there looks like you. You're not going to win. Uh, you're a fool. And, and I remember being taken aback because I, I would think, well, I didn't move to Lincoln Square because people looked like me or didn't look like me. I moved there because I liked the neighborhood. And the people are very nice. Um, and I'm running in my neighborhood because I like my neighborhood. I'm not going to move somewhere that where more people look like me just so I can represent them. That's not why I got into politics. Um, and I think it's been a good experience for the South Asian community because I think there's always this push amongst immigrant or, or minority communities where you're like, okay, well, we need to get the map a certain way to do X, Y, and Z so that we can get a representative. And certainly that is part of the equation, but sometimes it is just about running where you live and supporting good candidates where they are. Um, and so while it's been an incredible honor, the one thing I've been trying to do over the last seven years is uh, encourage more young people, particularly Indian Americans, South Asians, um, to run for office and say, you don't need to move somewhere strategically to be an elected official. Run where you live. 
-hmm. So it's been an honor. Um, and, you know, we have a lot more Asian American representatives. Raja Krishnamurthy mm -hmm. um, was elected to Congress. Uh, Tammy Duckworth is a U.S. Senator. Mm -hmm. Ram Vililalam is the first uh, uh, state senator um, that's of uh, Indian American uh, origin. So I think we have a lot of Asian Americans that have been elected in the last seven years. And I'm certainly not taking credit for it, but I just think that um, I think my hope is that it opens some doors for people. Mm -hmm. Um, another question that I had here was, so why choose to be a political official instead of a career worker with the city? Um, frankly, it's not that easy to get a career official job with the city. I found it to be easier to, to, to run for office and, and, than it was to get a job with the city. Um, I'm being serious. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, um, a lot of politics and public service is relational. And I think, you know, sometimes when you're from the outside and you don't have someone vouching for you, it's hard to get a break. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, again, I think it's important to open doors for people too. And I feel that as part of my responsibility is that, you know, the doors weren't open for me. I had to sort of kick my way in. Um, but then once I did, it's my responsibility to try to help people so that they don't have to figure out how to kick their way in, that there are people advocating for them. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm, when I leave office uh, next year, um, you know, I may work back in the public sector and, you know, be a, uh, a bureaucrat or, or uh, you know, um, an administration official, depending on, you know, who wins in the governor's race, who wins in the mayor's race. Mm -hmm. So I haven't ruled that out. I just think that, um, you know, for me, elected office was a good path, but also it wasn't really particularly easy to get a job in city government or in state government. What do you think made it difficult? I think very much, you know, the culture was different seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine, ten years ago. Uh, yeah. You really needed to know somebody. And I think that's the case with lots of jobs. Um, mm -hmm. But I think especially public service in Illinois and Chicago wasn't the easiest of systems to break into. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about this, but do you have any other tips of how to use your one's U Chicago network if they're interested in politics and advancing their career? Yeah, well, the good news is, I mean, the U Chicago network is probably one of the best networks on the planet. And so um, I promise you, you can find someone um, in the alumni network uh, at working at the highest levels of government, all the way to the most local levels of government. Um, I've never had an issue um, being able to connect with, with uh, alumni of the university. I mean, it's just been fantastic. And, you know, and what I like about the University of Chicago network is that I think people are always open to meeting with other alumni. And so I think I, I appreciate that. So I always like to ask a question of what do you wish your younger self had known that you know now? Um, you know, I wasn't a very good student um, mm -hmm. in high school. Um, and I think I took some things for granted, uh, I don't, I, you know, and I think part of what um, I try to talk to young people about is, you know, love of learning is important. Um, don't obsess over tasks and don't obsess over things. I think part of what, what I wish I'd known is to take advantage of all the opportunities that were available to me in high school, um, because I did develop, eventually did develop a love of learning. I spent a lot of time in graduate school, uh, but I wish I'd been more intentional um, as a teenager. Great. That's wonderful. So is there any final things you'd like to say to those who are watching? Yeah, um, I would, I think the next few years are going to be um, really interesting. I'm sure if you watch the news or follow Twitter, you can see the day to day happenings. But um, I say that because we need more people from various backgrounds to run for office to get involved in public service. Because remember, government is just you and me. It's just a reflection of where you and I are. And if we want it to be a better reflection, then more people need to get involved. Um, more people need to push, more people need to organize. And it's really fantastic to see young people, especially in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, um, more women and more women of color organize with the Women's March. But we need to sustain that. And, and the way you sustain those movements and the way you build on those movements and then translate those movements into policy and those policies impacting and changing people's lives is if we stay engaged. It can't be 
a, a moment in time. It can't be momentary. It has to be sustained. And that's why we need more people to get involved. And so as I exit office, I hope some of you are thinking about running for office in the next municipal cycle, the next mid uh, in the midterms or in 2020, because we need good people. Um, this network uh, is a fantastic network. You're qualified and you should run. And I, and I hope to see some of you out there. Great. Thank you so much. So I just want to thank everybody who tuned in and sent us great questions. And I want to thank you again, Amaya, for joining us thank today you. and sharing about the Chicago political system and just your encouraging words for all of us to consider if we should get involved in public service. Um, join us next week on May 9th for Bouncing Back, 10 Ways to Build Resilience. And also, if you're in the Chicago area, Alumni Weekend is coming up at the end of the month, May 30th to June 3rd. We'd love to see you on campus to register for that event. The Careers Program is doing an entrepreneurial networking breakfast. So if you want to meet five of Chicago's up and coming fabulous entrepreneurs, they'll be there talking on a panel and then around for a meal afterwards. So please consider joining us. Have a great rest of your day and take care. Bye.